Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Portland Audubon's Wild Arts Festival panel discussion this morning. We're going to give folks a few more minutes to tune in, and then we'll get started more formally with the program overview and instructions. So everybody just hang on for a couple more minutes before we get rolling. All right, let's get rolling, everybody. Thanks again for being here. My name is Trisha Sears, and I'm a member of the Portland Audubon Wild Arts Book Fair Committee. I'm very excited to be part of that. Welcome to this author panel. We're so glad that you could join us this morning and appreciate you taking the time to do so. During this panel, the audience can submit questions through the chat feature on Zoom. We encourage you to ask questions, which we will take at the end of the panel. <clears throat> Um, and we'll do that for about 15 minutes at the end. Just a heads up though, that we may not get to every single question that you send in, so thanks. Now, as many of you know, the Portland Audubon Wild Arts Festival is one of our premier fundraising events. All the proceeds go to support the many critical education, conservation, and animal rehabilitation programs. The Wild Arts Festival brings together a wonderful mix of artists and authors, and all with a love of nature and the Pacific Northwest. In addition, the Wild Arts Festival features our silent auction, which is another fun way to celebrate and support the Portland Audubon. Next, I'm going to introduce the panelists and the moderator for this session. As you can see on the screen, this morning's panel discussion is comprised of authors John Marsloff, Lee Vanderroo, and Dan Matthews, along with our moderator, Bob Salinger. So let's start with Dan or Daniel. Daniel Matthews is a science writer probably best known around here for his book, Cascade Olympic Natural History. It has been said that Mr. Matthews lives for hiking and backpacking in the Pacific Northwest. Indeed, he's put a lot of miles on his boots from his Portland base, where he currently lives with his wife, Sabrina. He's never failed to stop, pay attention, and learn about the plants and animals he's walking by. <clears throat> Over the years, he's turned his knowledge into beautifully written and photographed books on the natural history of Western mountains, as shown in his book, The Natural History of the Pacific Northwest Mountains and others. His most recent book, The Eerily Relevant Trees in Trouble, Wildfires, Infestations, and Climate Change, takes a darker look at the landscape and the ways our human lives have encroached upon the lives of our Western forests. Although Trees in Trouble documents forests in peril, excuse me, in peril, it is not without hope and even points towards some solutions. Next up, John Marsloff, professor of wildlife science at the University of Washington, is known for his excellent work on the oncology and behavioral biology of jays, crows, ravens, and their relatives. He's also ventured into the worlds of robins, wrens, and other wildlife in our backyards. 
In addition to his research, he's written several popular science books about crows, including Gifts of the Crow, How Perception, Emotion, and Thought Allow Smart Birds to Behave Like Humans. In his latest work, In Search of Metal Arcs, Birds, Farms, and Food in Harmony with the Land, he explores the connection between birds, humans, and food production. He presents an ornithologist's observations of farming practices that provide practical solutions for sustainable food production that also support bird and wildlife conversation. His other books offered during this Wild Arts Festival are Welcome to Suburbia and Gifts of the Crow. John and his wife, Colleen, also a wildlife biologist, have written Dog Days, Raven Nights, a fascinating chronicle of the winter ecology of the common raven. <clears throat> Lee Vanderview is an award-winning investigative and environmental journalist. In her new book, As the World Burns, Vanderview reports on the groundbreaking court case pitting young adults against the forces behind climate change in Juliana versus the United States. This is a vital story about the environment, the law, and a new generation of activists. 21 young people from across America sued the federal government over climate change charging that U.S. actions to promote a fossil fuel economy violate their constitutional rights to life, liberty, and property. The story unfolds against the backdrop of floods, wildfires, rising seas, hurricanes, and a congressional fight for power with a U.S. president who refuses to acknowledge any of it. Based in Oregon, Vanderview's previous story, The Fish Market, Inside the Money Battle for the Ocean and Your Dinner Plate, earned the Oregon Book Award 2018 winner for general nonfiction. In this book, she portrays the recent shift of the fishing industry from public to private and how it changed the relationship between wild seafood and the people who eat it. Lee is deeply involved in nonprofit journalism and is the former managing director of the nonprofit newsroom, Investigate West. Please go ahead and check out all of our author pages online at the Wild Arts Festival website, wildartsfestival.org. Today, our Bob, uh, excuse me, Bob is our moderator. Bob Salinger has worked for Portland Audubon since 1992. His current responsibilities include directing Portland Audubon's conservation policy initiatives, wild, <clears throat> excuse me, wildlife research initiatives, backyard habitat certification program, and the Wildlife Care Center. Bob's passion for conservation was directly developed early exploring the woods of Massachusetts and later on solo hikes from Mexico to Canada on the Pacific Crest Trail and from Canada to Southern Colorado on the Continental Divide. Bob has a BA in biology from Reed College and a JD from Lewis and Clark School. He currently serves as board president of Humane Oregon and the board of the Intertwine Alliance. He lives in Northeast Portland with his wife, Elizabeth Neely, three children, an assortment of dogs, goats, cats, chickens, and other critters. Bob has graciously stepped in for us today as the moderator because Gloria D. Brown was unable to make it. Please check out her excellent and inspiring book, Black Woman in Green, Gloria Brown and the Unmarked Trail to Forest Service Leadership, which was published in February of this year. You can find the book on the Wild Arts Festival website author pages. All right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob now, thanks. Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning. We really appreciate having all three of you here. I've had a chance to read all three of your books, and I thought they were really fascinating, enlightening, uh, and hopeful in a time where we need uh, hope. And I really encourage anybody to go out and read uh, any, all three of these books, uh, not just if you're interested in the environment, but also if you're interested just in the social uh, challenges that we're having across our landscape and, and sort of some of the underlying ways to think about them perhaps. Uh, so I want to jump right into the questions. Um, and so I'm gonna ask all three of you to briefly tell us about the books that you've written and what inspired you to write these books? Uh, wh why are these books now? And why don't we start with Lee? You're on mute. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I really couldn't resist this story, honestly. Um, you know, it, this lawsuit, Juliana versus the United States, was filed in 2015. And um, so as a journalist in Oregon, I was hearing a lot about it because it was filed in the U.S. District Court of Eugene. 
Um, and, you know, honestly, I think like a lot of people, I just thought maybe it was a publicity stunt or sort of a lark. And it really defied expectations in making it all the way to trial in 2018. And I was really, as it got closer, more and more riveted by this story of these 21 kids. When they filed the suit, they were between the ages of eight and 19. Um, they're now five years older. Um, but in 2018, when they were headed into court, um, I just was fascinated by the question of who are they? Why are they doing this? Um, and are they being, you know, stage managed by adults? Are they really in this with their whole hearts? And, and you know, I found that they were, but, um, you know, I committed uh, at that maybe summertime 2018 to covering the trial and to getting to know these people and their families and where they come from in advance of um, reporting on, on their litigation. And so uh, I spent that summer doing some traveling to the regions they come from. They come from all over the United States and reporting on climate change, where they live, getting to know them, getting to know their families and pre preparing for trial. And um, as, as many folks may know, their trial was canceled in the fall of 2018 due to some really um, unprecedented legal maneuvers by the Trump administration. And so um, what was supposed to be trial coverage became me uh, hanging around Eugene, wondering what to do with, with 21 kids who were suing the federal government. I ended up following them for the next year and um, that became the book. Thanks, Lee. Why don't we move to Dan? Well, as I wrote my natural history field guidebooks um, and did a lot of traveling around the mountains of the Northern Rockies and the Northwest, and uh, I couldn't miss the fact that there were problems facing the forests. Um, there have been just huge uh, epidemics of bark beetles and some other insect pests. Um, worse epidemics probably than, than have ever in thousands of years hit these particular forests. And uh, as, as Annie Prue wrote in her memoir, uh, most of the, of the lodgepole pines in Colorado and Southern Wyoming where she lives uh, are standing dead. And this was 12 years ago. And it's astonishing that, that many, many people in the East have no idea that this ever even happened. And lodgepole pines there are, they're the main tree over huge parts of the, the forested parts of those states. So it's, it's an incredible sight. And if you go into central British Columbia, it's uh, an area the size of Wisconsin uh, where uh, a large percentage of the trees died. And um, you know a substantial percentage, more than more than twenty percent, uh, died within a few years, uh, and um, and of course then there are the fires. Um, as this fall was probably the worst fire year yet, uh, or close to it, and so that um, that woke people up in the east, I think, more than the bark beetle epidemics did. Um, but, but it's all part of a picture of uh, climate change hitting forests. And uh, it's, it's really global, but I had to focus. So I focused on the pines of the West so as not to be taking on uh, too much. But um, it, it's, it's a very forbidding scene. Uh, we are gonna lose a lot of forests, but there are things that can be done and they need a lot more uh, political and financial support. Um, so so that's, uh, that's the main message I'm pushing, as well as, of course, uh, fighting climate change by reducing emissions. Thanks, Dan. And we'll move to John. All right. <clears throat> Thanks for the question, Bob. Um, a couple of things motivated me to write this book. First, I think when we used to travel <laughs> a lot more than the last year, uh, all it takes is one trip across the, the continent, whether it's Europe or North America or, or Asia, and the biggest signal you see on the land is agriculture. Uh, we've converted over a third of the terrestrial planet to feed ourselves and fuel our cars and feed our animals that we eat. And so it's a huge effect, uh, and I think it's an important one to understand um, there's been a lot done on it with respect to how it 
how that change in the landscape affects animals and plants and, and humans, less about how birds are adapting to these changes and uh, living on farms. And I grew up in Kansas uh, for a good part of my life and was surrounded by meadowlarks uh, there singing all the time. And they were one of the most common birds. They're a good signal of being in kind of an open prairie-like environment and their song's fabulous and it gave me joy and it's given lots of other people joy. They've been designated as the state bird for uh, six different states and have motivated a lot of people and yet their numbers are plummeting. And in the east, the uh, eastern metal arc is down 70% from what it was just four decades ago. There are few birds that have dropped so quickly and so um, strongly over such a large area. And yet, most people that know metal arcs and have lived with them um, do still see them. They're still around. And so they're kind of a species that goes under the radar in terms of declining and not being so obvious. It, it's not as uh, strong of a signal, perhaps, as even climate change and, and fire frequencies as, as Lee and Dan are talking about here. So it's, it's harder to get people's, people excited about them. So I wanted to do that and just bring the plight of grassland birds in general up to uh, a broader audience and also then see how that intersects with how we get our food because we obviously need to eat. My one daughter is a farmer and so I was motivated from her um, experiences as well to understand what's going on on a lot of young people's farms and a big uh, return kind of to the land that a lot of young people are doing in Europe and North America at least uh, to raise food for us and pres presumably a uh, more uh, ecologically sensitive way. Thanks, John. It, it's interesting to note that Meadowlark is a state bird of Oregon and was selected almost 100 years ago by the school children of Oregon in every county uh, through an Audubon contest. And there was an effort a couple of years ago to dethrone <laughs> the Meadowlark as a state bird by the Oregon legislature. Uh, which wound up being one of the most hotly contested issues of that legislative session. Uh, we mobilized people and it went statewide. It was amazing to see how many people rose up to defend the meadowlark and it was great. Um, but uh, indicative of the fact that uh, the reason they wanted to, to change it was because people just don't see them that much anymore, right. um, which is a cause to uh, find a way to save them, not to um, extinguish them. Um, so one of the things I loved about all three of your books was that you told your stories largely through people that you met as you, you traveled around and, and through their eyes, uh, which gives it all three just a, an amazing human uh, dimension on uh, very complex issues. And I was wondering if each one of you could tell us a bit about one person that you met uh, while you were writing these books that you found particularly interesting or intriguing or inspiring. And why don't we start this time with Dan? Um, well, I'll go with the easy choice of the scientists I, I, I spent time with, uh, Diana Six, the one with the uh, wild backstory. Um, as a teenager, she dropped out of high school uh, to join a uh, biker gang, a, a violent, uh, druggy biker gang, and uh, she had two brief marriages to um, violent and threatening men, both of whom are dead today. Um, and uh, within, she, as she said, you know, I, I wore black leather, I scared people. Um, but um, she turned things around, she realized this was heading nowhere. And she had to disappear for a few years so as not to get chased down by the bikers. And uh, then she got back into community college and without you know, any great sense of what she wanted to study. She thought maybe in library science because she liked libraries, but, but uh, she had some teachers who encouraged her and she found she always loved both fungi and insects. And uh, so she went with that and ended up 
uh, years behind the uh, the normal academic schedule, but she ended up with a PhD and is a very distinguished science a scientist today, and also working hard at the age of 60 to be kind of a Renaissance woman. Uh, she's active on Twitter, where uh, I think half of her tweets are sharing paintings she's working on. She's working on painting. She does a lot of long distance uh, bike touring. And of course, she's still very passionate about um, insects and fungi and where they come together, of which bark beetles are a notable example, uh, because bark beetles, uh, when they attack trees, they always bring uh, a, f a few species of fungi with them that attack the tree. Uh, they aren't what kills the tree in these cases. Uh, Dr. Six has, has fought very hard against that uh, viewpoint, which, which has been rejected now. Um, the, the fungi uh, serve as the food for the bark beetles and the bark beetles girdle the trees. But anyway, that's kind of an aside. She's, she's quite a character and it was great spending time with her. I have to note that you left one important detail out of the uh, fact that both of her, her former husbands are now deceased. Uh, you noted in the book that she says that she did not kill them. <laughs> right, she said it wasn't me. <laughs> um, why don't we go to John? Sure, I didn't have any bikers that I uh, dealt with, but that would have been fun. Um, probably the most inspirational one to me is a, a 75 year old man in Costa Rica now. He's uh, He went to Costa Rica um, gosh, it's been probably 50 years ago um, from Colorado State University as a beef producer. And he flew over to Costa Rica on a DC-3 loaded up with 20 cows, his wife and his kid, and uh, settled into raising hamburgers basically <laughs> in the Costa Rican rainforest, uh, which was certainly a, a environmental disaster of the first order um, in lots of tropical countries. And he um, quickly learned that the wildlife there wasn't doing very well on, on intensively um, farmed lands, uh, those that were basically converted from forest to pasture. And monkeys in particular were having a hard time traveling through his, his ownership there. And he started expanding the hedgerows, uh, living fences actually that they used there. Um, so the trees became the supports for the fence. And uh, the monkey started using those and traveling more and more and more wildlife was coming through. And uh, he was enamored with that and started, you know, telling other people about the animals on his land that he and his family were enjoying. And it burgeoned into a bit of a tour business to start. And this was still in a part of Costa Rica where there was not uh, electricity, no roads really uh, to access it very easily up through the 70s and 80s. When they finally got electricity, uh, he ate, was able to basically accommodate more and more visitors and turned a cattle ranch into a uh, ecotourism uh, destination, uh, Baru, Hacienda Baru. And it's a great place to go. You can see 300, 400 species of birds there, all kinds of wildlife. They're still missing the two big ones. The, the jaguar uh, occasionally uh, comes through and the, the Baird's tapir, both of which require big reserves elsewhere, um, occasionally uh, come through, but they're, they haven't established themselves. And that's kind of what he's hoping uh, will be the final um, tribute to his efforts. But up till now, he's, he's been uh, basically transformed from a cattleman to a conservationist before anybody even knew what, what that uh, ecotourism business was. Amazing. Thank you, John. And Lee, I have to say, I, you know, asking you to choose among children is a terrible request. Uh, so, but nonetheless, tell us about one of the, the kids that uh, you found really amazing. They're all amazing. They're all truly amazing. The stories were totally compelling. They are all amazing. And, and all of these plaintiffs made an incredible impression on me. It is kind of hard to pick. Um, just in a broad sweep, I'll say like, they represent everything from the Arctic lifestyle of interior Alaska all the way to the barrier islands off the east coast of Florida. So they come from really diverse places, really diverse age range, and um, 
half of the uh, plaintiffs are people of color, six with indigenous roots. So this is a very, very dynamic group of people. Um, but I would probably say that Levi Dreheim made, um, it, it was the most unique experience for me meeting him because um, at the time of the litigation's filing, he was eight years old. Um, I think he was 11 the first time that I interviewed him and I had never interviewed anybody that young before. And um, it was the day that Hurricane Michael hit Florida and I went to Florida to meet him. Um, and if you remember that hurricane, that's the one that destroyed Mexico City in the panhandle. Uh, we were on the other side of Florida on a barrier island where he lives in Satellite Beach. And the, the wind was terrible. I, because of it, I had gotten in really late the night before because of just flight delays and that sort of um, weather, uh, weather delay. And <laughs> because of that, I had the only thing that the car rental agency was able to give me was a sports car. So I had this like really pimped out Camaro that I was driving. I don't really regularly even drive. And I was just driving this sports car to meet an eight year old. And it was like, you know, we met in the parking lot at the beach and he was just like, oh my God, is that a Camaro? How fast does it go? <laughs> you know, so that like, that was our, our meeting. And, and he's such a curious, exuberant, um, like really extroverted personality that like for our first like 20 minutes, I was like, I don't know who's interviewing who. I had never interviewed anybody that young and I didn't really know, um, you know, how much he would really know about climate change. Um, here he's a litigant and he's representing the fact that his community is about to go um, in his lifetime underwater. And it's already, he's been evacuated three times already because of hurricanes at the point that I met him. I think actually there's been two more since then. So, you know, he, he's living this um, climate breakdown is, is very real for him. It, it's part of his life. Um, but I didn't know how well at his age he could articulate that or, or had the knowledge of the science. And I didn't know, you know, really had a had to push him on questions at that age and he was just like honestly very well educated and very adept at answering questions and it just kind of reminded me that kids are very like straight ahead you know they will tell you what's real they're not trying to filter or be political or dance around the kinds of things that you know the complexities that we start to understand as adults as we get older in the world they're just telling you what's what's true and they have a very uh, northern compass, I guess, for what's right, you know? We teach kids all the time, you know, do the right thing and, and try to, you know, try to be fair. And, and so they have a sense of, I think, um, justice and equity that's like really baked in. So I found it really refreshing actually after that point to be interviewing uh, such young people because they're very, um, they're very composed. They're all very well, well educated, far better educated than I was when I came to the subject matter, frankly, um, than, and, and more so than a lot of people. And they're also just, you know, they have real passion for the subject matter and, um, uh, you know, can can talk about it in such a clear-eyed way um, that I think is really difficult for a lot of adults to do. Yeah, it's really interesting in Oregon. I think one of the biggest changes I've seen in the 30 years I've been doing activist work in Oregon is the uh, resurgence of youth in the discussion. Um, it really has been uh, a profound change in the last you know five to seven years where, where youth are really getting involved not just on the streets and the protests but actually showing up at the hearings and preparing and doing just incredible jobs as you said sort of laying it out in a very straightforward honest way it, it's it's really shifted the discussion profoundly um, and put politicians on notice in a completely different way than uh, what I've seen before it's, it's really had a profound effect um, I'm seeing that on farms as well, you know, with young young people getting into to farming. So, yeah, and they bring such a, a broader base of education with them, as you mentioned, Lee, I think it's, it's, it's hopeful. I think yeah. it's, it's, Sorry, go ahead, Lee. 
Sorry, I think it's just like it, it's unconventional, but it sort of flips the, the wisdom paradigm to 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 talk about climate change with young people, because, you know, we're only for the last six years ha has climate um, science been recommended uh, curriculum for for students right so you know they're articulating something that they understand very well because they've learned it at school and to a group group of preceding you know generations that don't have as firm a grasp of the subject matter um and it's 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 interesting culturally i think because they're taught and we're taught that because we're older we're smarter <laughs> and we're just necessarily wiser but on climate change honestly i think that younger people have a much firmer grasp absolutely um you know and i it's dan and john you're, you're both you both wrote about fields where uh they're having a hard time moving the next generation into agriculture and into forestry uh you know one of the things we hear a lot is that you know those communities are um uh disappearing in part because kids are moving away they're not following their parents either because it's not economically viable or just because they want to pursue other things I, I, i'm curious uh particularly john uh just because you spend so much time with with families on the landscape are you seeing uh this entry of youth, it, you know, or, or the shift in the way people are thinking about the land also bringing youth back into it? Are you seeing that there's maybe perhaps more hope for the next generation to follow up as this moves forward? I think there's hope, but there's big challenges as well. Um, a lot of the traditional rural families have indeed left the farm. Uh, the, the next generation isn't going to take over the family farm. That's, that's a very common thread across industrial agriculture. Uh, in what, what I think we're seeing is a change, though, in the kind of young person that is looking at agriculture as an option. And I would just use my daughter as an example, but there are many that were like this. These are kids who have a basic uh, liberal arts sort of education that might have directed their own study of agriculture at their university. Uh, so they got the technical things and then they do a lot of interning and going around the world, working and volunteering on different farms. There's lots of programs for that, for them to, to gain the skill that they need. And, and then they want to go back to the land, uh, you know, much as Lee articulated to do the right thing. And what's the challenge for them is being able to buy land. And it's, it's virtually impossible for a young farmer to uh, be able to buy land uh, with the, the amount of money that you make farming. You can make enough money and they do make enough money to live and survive well once the uh, land is there because they don't use a lot of machinery. They don't have a lot of those costs that other farmers do. But uh, getting access to the land is, is a challenge. There are grant programs that we could foster better. There are rental programs. There are programs that allow uh, farmers that are currently working to sell at a reduced rate or reduced tax burden to young farmers. So there's a lot of movement there, but that's still, I think, the biggest challenge for, for this new generation to get back on the land. John, where do your daughter and your uh, nephew farm? My daughter farms on Vashon uh, and Vashon Island off of, uh, off of the, in the Puget Sound here. And my nephew farms in Virginia uh, in an inland place. But again, a lot of these young farmers are near urban centers where they can sell their boutique sort of um, crops to restaurants and um, farmers markets and um, directly through um, CSA services to the public. Great. Well, as I mentioned, you know, each of you tells your stories through the ideas of people on the landscape. Lee, you focused on the kids, and John on farmers and uh, and ranchers, and Dan uh, primarily on scientists and people uh, exploring how to uh, protect our forests. Um, as an activist-based organization, um, you know, we, we we live in a very very polarized world, and um, I'm curious what each one of you learned perhaps about how we might bridge some of this polarization. Uh, you know, what, what did you take away from your conversations 
uh, that you like to impart to folks about how we might move beyond what I, I consider the most polarized time, certainly that I've been doing this work in, uh, where conversations are, are so hard to, to have these days. And why don't we start with, um, with, with Dan on this one? Uh, I have to admit, I, the polarization is just unfathomable to me. I don't, I don't see what, how we move uh, toward, toward getting science and facts to people who choose news sources that, that contradict the science and the facts. Um, I think as far as the big picture of climate change goes, um, everybody's gonna be seeing climate change. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna change attitudes over the next, with, you know, it, it's happening already. It'll happen more and more over the next 10 years. Uh, there won't be many people left saying climate isn't changing. Um, but what will they say? Um, I, I think maybe uh, some of them will be saying, okay, I admitted I was wrong and I'm ready to fight climate change. Um, some may be saying the climate is changing, but it's natural. I don't know. I don't think that one will be as big a group, but I'm afraid that maybe a lot will, who were hardcore climate deniers today may be saying, um, well, climate changed, but there was nothing we could do about it. It was too big. Um, all we can do is adapt. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be more of that first group, you know, who will, who will come around and say, oh my God, I was wrong. This is a really serious problem and we've, and we've got to do everything we can. Um, <laughs> I guess that's about as well as I can answer the polarization question. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Emily? You know, yeah, it's, these are just really strange times. Um, I, I think that I, to, I learned a lot actually from several of the Juliana plaintiffs who are living in communities where um, the message that, that they are bringing about the urgency of climate change is really at odds with the culture in which they live in. So. Um, Jacob LaBelle and Alex Loznak are both from Southern Oregon. They grew up on family farms uh, on, the, on the west and east side of Roseburg. And, you know, that climate change is not a real popular uh, subject there. Um, there's a lot of climate denial. And it, I, I found it really interesting to talk in some depth with Jacob about um, how to approach people. He, he really has a very interesting um, manner of uh, dealing with, with this kind of thing. And, and that is that he studied the teachings of MLK and um, he participated in the Standing Rock uh, movement. He also um, was really watching closely the young people from uh, Florida who in the wake of the Parkland shooting um, were stumping around the country for, uh, for some legislation on, on gun control. So, um, you know, he's really studied up on it and kind of came to the conclusion that just standing in front of things and being a person who other people can relate to um, and, and like uh, is, is the best approach. And I think that he said that that was like the fourth teaching of MLK, um, you know, and, and he described it to me very well, but he would do this where, you know, he, he's surrounded by very conservative neighbors when his parents bought the property on which he has his farm. Um, they found like stashes of guns in the hills, or, or at least there had been a tell of that from the previous owner and they knew that they were in kind of like a hotbed of white supremacy. They bought the place for the land and built an incredible biodynamic farm there over the last, I think like 18 years. But he just walks to his nearest neighbor's house and he's in this, you know, contentious stew that we're talking about. 
And so he has said, like, sometimes if he's looking for a way to phrase something, because he knows how he has an interview or, or um, I don't want to speak too much for him, but he has told me that he will try things out on his neighbors to kind of see, you know, if they'll resonate or if people can hear him. And we'll, we'll practice to a degree, like, how to um, take the responsibility of, of being the person who a lot of people are looking at. I thought that was really interesting. Thank you, Lee. And, and John? Well, I would um, go back to a couple of the ranchers that I talked with in Montana, um, Hillary and Malou Anderson uh, in particular, and they've um, dealt with the issue of controlling uh, carnivores and, ac and loss of stock to carnivores, grizzlies and wolves, primarily uh, on their holdings. And they've basically uh, gave me a, a good advice a couple of uh, different ways on this question. The first is kind of relating back to Dan's answer. Sometimes attitudes only change one funeral at a time was a quote that, that they gave me. And, and that's just sometimes what it takes. The generation needs to turn over and uh, new thoughts will come into play uh, when it does. But secondly, they uh, have, in both cases, two different uh, places in Montana have started community organizations with their ranching neighbors, because they are, they are ranchers as well. Uh, and although they have very progressive ideas about how to mitigate and reduce uh, conflict with carnivores, their neighbors would just as soon shoot wolves and have, and same with grizzlies. And their strategy is basically to start with common uh, agreed principles, such as we want to minimize loss. No, all of the ranchers wanted to minimize loss of their stock. And then through community uh, building um, exercises, really informal gatherings for things as simple as sharing dinner together, uh, trying to build a community of trust. Once you have that trust on on a topic that is not controversial, then you move towards the more controversial things and expand your vision in these community organizations from just reducing loss to reducing loss and maintaining a vibrant wildlife community, reducing loss and maintaining carnivores as a final step. And they're not there yet, but that's that's their strategy to work with. And it, it makes sense to me. I mean, we all have common, um, beliefs that we can share and, and agree upon and you just need to find those and start there and sometimes you can change uh, attitudes or or come to see the other point of view and maybe shift your own um, sometimes it takes a funeral yeah, it's interesting right now you know I, I you've all touched on this I think that um where we do our best work bridging the divide, especially the urban rural divide is when we actually get together and spend a lot of time the process has been successful but the ones that we have invested years and years in meeting with people and getting on the ground and spending time together. Even if we still disagree, it creates an opportunity for dialogue and finding common ground as well as places where you can disagree. It's, it's challenging now in the age of COVID because you can't really do that anymore. Um, and I wonder how that will play out over time and if we'll find digital mechanisms to build those bridges as well. Um, <laughs> We have primarily an urban and suburban audience at Wildlife at the Wild Arts Festival, and I'm curious what what re one recommendation would you make to the folks listening today to make a difference on the issues that you're working on right now? Uh, is is there one thing that you took away from your books in terms of uh, something that folks can go home and do uh, to be part of the solution for the forest issues, for climate change, Lee, or for um, uh, these agricultural challenges, um, you know, given the fact that most people we're talking to today are, are relatively small landowners, urban lots, suburban lots. Uh, why don't we start this time with John? Sure. I mean, we all eat. So you can adjust what you eat um, to be a little bit easier on the land. And you don't have to be a vegan. You don't have to be a vegetarian. Uh, as you move towards those diets, it's, it's more healthy. Uh, for you, and it's also more healthy for the land. It gives us more options to be able to in less intensively use every bit of land for agriculture. And, and the most important thing in that respect that I found, at least in the 
in the studies that others have done is to reduce the amount of uh, red meat that we eat from um, uh, cows, goats, and sheep. And I am, I, again, I'm not saying don't eat any, but the science that's been done suggests if we limit that to one meal a week, uh, we would have a great effect on reducing the demand for land because most of the agricultural crops grown at least in the Midwest US, corn and soybeans are just simply going to feeding cows or being converted to fuel. They're not going into our diet directly. So reducing that demand uh, from, um, from a demand for grain fed beef is a great powerful thing that each of us can do as a consumer. Thanks, John. And, and I also thought, you know, on that, on that topic too, your discussion of meat production and its relationship to disease and viruses and things like that was absolutely fascinating and terrifying all yeah, the more scary. so with COVID. Um, that, that, that chapter should be required reading um, for everybody. Uh, Dan? Could you uh, restate the what what urban people can do in terms of in terms of fire? What is there something you know? I always love to leave people with with something they can do to get involved. And you know, uh, we're talking about urban populations and suburban populations mainly that are listening today, probably. But uh, I was curious if you had any recommendation for what people could do in terms of getting involved with the fire issue. And mm hmm. Um. You know, um, the urban population isn't very directly involved, but of course we suffer the smoke. Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, clean air regulation is something of an obstacle to the prescribed burning which needs to be done. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, if there's any silver lining to what we all went through in September um, this year, with the smoke, uh, it'll be that people will realize the wildfire smoke uh, is so bad that it might well be worth relaxing um, air quality regulation a little bit as regards to uh, prescribed fire, because pre prescribed fire is going to make some smoke, uh, but um, all the studies show that it, it can be less intense smoke and less bad for you. And it's, uh, it's about the only option we have uh, to reduce the, the risk of really terrible smoke episodes like we had in September. Um, so, uh, so mostly, you know, my emphasis is, is on toward uh, basically political viewpoints, what we're willing to vote for, what we're willing to uh, be taxed for, what we're willing to ask our representatives in Congress to do, uh, which is we need, we need to fight climate change and we need to support um, forest restoration in the West. Thanks, Dan. And Lee. Yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna punt the question, but I think it's important to remember with regard to climate change that like we need wholesale systemic change and that individual action, um, there are real limits to it in fighting the problem. And I, I say that only to emphasize, um, you know, where people might want to direct their, their energies. Um, one of the plaintiffs in the Juliana case, uh, Chitescott Martinez said to me in an interview, and, it, and it's in the book that, that he really felt strongly that the climate fight needs everybody and everybody has different skills. And I thought that was a really interesting way of, um, you know, articulating that there's something that everybody can do. Um, and I try not to be too prescriptive because whatever I might say <laughs> is probably not right for everyone, right? I mean, certainly to the point of, of a vegetarian diet, like we know that that is one of the, um, one of the singular things that we can do that would have the biggest impact. Um, food waste is also a real significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions so you can compost um, but definitely uh, be politically active and um, maybe uh, recognize climate uh, climate change as a profound intergenerational justice issue um, this has enormous enormous consequences for people who are young and we need to really take that to heart 
Thank you. All right, let's um, let's jump to some audience questions. We have a few in the queue, so um, uh, why don't we start with one for John? But anybody, feel free to jump in here. Uh, if, if we if we switch to a plant based diet, wouldn't that improve the impact of agriculture on our planet? Help retain wolves, which are being killed at an alarming level. Yeah, I mean it definitely is a important switch. Um, and as Lee said, I mean switching to a plant-based diet has benefits for climate big time because of the uh, belching of the ruminants that we're farming and eating. Uh, th they're major contributors of methane to the environment, which is a super potent greenhouse gas. So you get double benefit, plus it's more healthy for you um, to reduce your use of those foods. The studies that I read um, suggest, again, that a more balanced diet, the kind of Mediterranean diet you've heard of, uh, is one that will definitely give us more options to reduce climate effects and reduce land conversion effects of agriculture uh, going forward. And the studies were interesting in that they look at uh, crossing planetary uh, boundaries, thresholds that, that will be have major effects on um, ecological functioning of our planet. And um, by scaling back, as I said, to like one meal a week, uh, a couple of meals of, of white meat like chickens, um, those things will give us greater options over the next 50 years to be able to one, feed several billion more people. Uh, the expectation is 11 billion people by 2100 on this planet. And uh, we, we, they, they're going to demand food. It's a more, uh, it's a richer um, population of humans as well that is demanding more luxury foods, i.e. meat in their diets. And so scaling back will allow us to feed that growing and more affluent population while uh, dealing with climate issues and land conversion issues so that we're able to have some land for biodiversity. Thanks, Sean. Anybody else have any thoughts on that question? We can jump to one for Dan. Um, recently, OPB's Timber War podcast had an episode about the work done on the Malheur National Forest where environmentalists and loggers came up with a partnership for managing the forest together. Uh, have you seen other examples where that is happening? Yeah, there are lots of examples. It's a whole system, the collaboratives, and I think they're great. Um, uh, one of the scientists I spent a day with in New Mexico had done a lot of his work there as part of a collaborative. Uh, and um, we've, we've Rick Brown, who uh, probably a fair number of my listeners might be a little bit acquainted with because he's been around Portland Audubon a lot for decades. Um, He's a, a lifelong activist and he participated for years in the uh, collaborative based in Long, uh, in Lakeview, Oregon. Um, um, I'm not sure if that's, that's could be, no, I think it's on the Fremont National Forest. So not quite the same one that my uh, listener was asking about, but, uh, but similar. Um, Basically, they're, they're getting people together to work out forest plans that uh, will, will improve forest resilience and conserve the big, the big old trees, which are really important to conserve for wildlife and everything else, uh, but will yield some commercial products. It's funny, in New Mexico, where I visited, um, the, the forests are so unproductive that, that really the only um, economic benefit to the local community that they could come up with was a firewood cutting, uh, which is a commercial activity there. They, they actually turn some of it into briquettes that get shipped elsewhere. So it's, it's something of an economy, but, but not, like, uh, not like what the forests in Oregon can produce. Anyway, uh, yeah, collaboratives are great. Um, and, um, you know, there have been a lot of challenges. The biggest collaborative, I, I wrote a few pages on Four Fry, which is the biggest collaborative effort yet. It's in central Arizona. And uh, they've been very challenged over the 
over the few years since they came out with their big plan, they, it's been hard to actually get much of that forest restoration to happen and to get commercial partners to uh, participate and to succeed. Um, so um, we'll see, but it's a promising corner of the, uh, of the regulatory system. It really is, you know, we're involved in collaboratives in a variety of places, particularly audit now here in National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's, there are stronger ones and weaker ones, but uh, it, it's, I think, essential for starting to forge a path forward uh, and getting beyond some of these historic divisions. For those folks who are tracking the Elliott, a lot of members of Audubon have been involved with the Elliott State Forest. We're working toward a more collaborative model down there. Uh, right now. So that's a place to watch in terms of forest issues and uh, potential for these collaboratives to transcend some of these historic divides. Uh, by the way, I was talking to Rick Brown yesterday, Dan, so uh, he's still yeah. actively involved in that uh, in Audubon and, and an amazing resource. Uh, for Lee, um, this gets to what you were just talking about on, on the last question uh, that I asked you. Um, uh, this writer, this uh, person writes, I don't really see bold action on climate change. I believe we need actions by government businesses and individuals to abate the rapid pace we are seeing. Thoughts, and I, I would just tie that to something you wrote about that I thought was really fascinating is kind of a lifelong advocate for the existing regulatory system and working within that, uh, that these kids have decided that that's, that's not any good, or, or at least it's, it's not sufficient, that it, it's in some ways, ameliorating, but other ways propping up the um, existing challenges we have. And they wanted something that transcended that and, and went to the public trust doctrine as a more foundational approach. Um, so I just wondering if you can address further uh, this person's this person's question and comment. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, um, the legal theorists behind the Giuliana case called permits under the existing water acts um, the permission slips of unmitigated disaster. And I just, <laughs> I mean, that blew my mind too. And she has a book called Nature's Trust, which is a really interesting read. Um, and it is exactly about this issue. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about climate change and action on climate change. Um, most of them are really positive at this moment. I mean, I think a couple things about COVID to keep in mind. First of all, it crushed the fossil fuel industry. You know, we're in a moment where renewable energy is um, cheaper to deploy finally than fossil fuel, even with subsidies still in the mix. So um, our transition forward, especially under a blue president, really has a lot of potential to start mixing up the energy system. And we know that one of the biggest offenders uh, as far as fossil fuel emissions go is, is the energy system. So that's um, really positive. I mean, the other thing is that uh, you know, when, when economists started estimating what the cost of that transition would be just a few years ago, I want to say 2015, um, they pegged it at $2 trillion and we were heard that a lot about how, you know, well, that's too much, that'll break the bank, that means tax on ordinary individuals. And in fact, polls tell us that most Americans do actually believe in climate change and do want the United States government to do something about it where they differ and where they start to get off the bandwagon is on this question of how much will it cost me personally? Well, we just passed a $2 trillion uh, rescue plan under COVID that didn't cause everybody in America to have to be taxed. So I think it's gonna be a really difficult conversation to, uh, to try to pretend that that's the truth moving forward. You know, we have a president coming into the White House who has very, uh, does actually have a climate plan we saw climate change as part of the presidential debates for the first time in America. So I think the needle is really moving. And one thing um, that really excites me going forward is this case. I mean, I really do think that Juliana v. U.S. is one of the most important pieces of litigation that we will ever see in our lifetimes. And the Biden administration has an opportunity to settle this thing out. You know, so we have a president coming into office who wants to make progress on climate change with a, a significant piece of litigation in the federal courts, Biden could skirt this whole Congress's split thing, don't have the votes in the Senate by simply settling Juliana and making it a court order to go ahead and address climate change. That's huge. 
And I think that that could happen. That's cool. Mm. Would it be more valuable if, uh, if that happened at the Supreme Court level? Or, or does that make any sense even? I think it could be pretty dicey if it goes to the Supreme Court. Um, you know, right now it's, it's at the Ninth Circuit level, but if it were settled at that level, it would never be an appeal. Nobody's going to appeal a settlement. Right. Right? So the administration can, by consent decree, uh, which is a, you know, a settlement that's signed by a judge, essentially fortify um, a future generation's right to a stable climate under the Constitution. If that happened, would the other side likely appeal that to the Supreme Court? Well, the other side is the government. So if the government sits down with the plaintiffs and inks this deal and Joe Biden were to use it as an insurance policy on his climate remediation plan, it would be done. I, I guess I'm imagining some future other side, like if, if the court order led to some action which impacted an industry like the oil industry, then could the oil industry sue and take it to the Supreme Court? That's a possibility, I guess. Um, you know, one thing to note, though, is that the fossil fuel industry was represented in this case in the early days. And when Trump became president, um, the industry withdrew. They gave up their standing in the case, um, probably because they were getting to the point where it was discovery time and they were going to have to turn over documents. Um, so, you know, they, they bowed out. Um, so that will probably affect their ability to bring something else back in the future, but uh, no doubt people will try. Thank you, Lee. Uh, I, I love that line, that critique of uh, the existing regulatory framework. I try not to bend over pages in books, but I, I bent the corner of that page. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's really amazing comment. Um, so Lee, you just gave us uh, sort of what makes you hopeful. I, I wanted to end on that note, actually, and, and ask all three of you, you know, what after this experience gives you hope? Um, you know, these are challenging times. Maybe uh, there's a little more light today than there was a few weeks ago. But um, uh, what, what, what did you take away in terms of being hopeful at the end of this? And uh, I'll start with Dan on this one. And this will be our final question. To, to be honest, what gives me hope is walking in the woods, walking in the mountains and seeing, seeing nature at work. Um, I, I managed to get into the Eagle Creek burn uh, earlier this year um, and, and see um, it's not doing too badly. The fire was pretty severe um, uh, over a, a big core area, uh, but um, a lot of plants are flourishing uh, and they're are scattered surviving trees across what appeared to be the most severe parts. Um, so this, the scattered tall Douglas firs that survived will be helping to reseed the next generation of trees. So, so when I just look close around me, there seems to be a lot of resilience in the world and, and that gives me hope. Thanks, Dan. And John? Well, what, what uh, gave me hope was seeing uh, wildlife on some of these farms. Um, you can go to the Midwest and, and get despair pretty quick, and I did. Uh, but going to some of these smaller farms, um, going to ranches in Montana that were ranching right in national wildlife refuges with sage grouse and wolves and grizzly bears and doing it in a sustainable way that wasn't reducing uh, those animals' ability to be on the land. Uh, going to vineyards where barn owls were uh, a highlight of, of the tasting experience there and um, seeing some of the high tech applications to guide fertilizer and water and, and use of resources that are can be quite intensive on farms, but limiting those by using high tech gave me hope that in the future we could farm a lot smarter and some of that smart might also involve leaving a little space there uh, for wild animals. Thanks, John. Yeah, no, those amazing, amazing stories you have in your book about that. Um, and Lee, you, you kind of answered it, but do you have anything else you would like to add? You get the final word. Uh, you know, I mean, I just have a, a, incredible confidence in young people. Um, so I'll, I'll add that, not to say that I'm abdicating my own responsibility to, to act to them, but I just, 
you know, I love that young people are diving in on these issues the way that they are. It's really inspiring. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for doing this today. We're a little bit over, so we're going to call it good here. Um, just want to really express my appreciation to all three of you for taking your time to be part of this event and uh, for being part of Wild Arts Festival in general uh, and for all of your work on these issues over the years. Uh, you've all been inspirations and uh, written amazing stuff on, on these issues, um, and that's what we need. We need good information. So again, I want to really recommend... Uh, these books to all of our listeners today, uh, Trees in Trouble by Dan Matthews, As the World Burns by Lee Vanderview, and uh, In Search of Meadowlarks by John Marsleff. Uh, so thank you all very much and have a great day. Thanks a lot, Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for Bob. And it was a pleasure. Nice, nice being pleasure. with all you guys.